Um, thank you so much, everyone, for coming today. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce um, myself and Zara and then pass over to Zara to introduce our fantastic speakers. Um, just a quick kind of introduction to the panel. Um, so for a long time, I think we've all been very aware of the impact of airbrushed, photoshopped models and celebrities in the mainstream media. But especially with the rise of social media, this has entered our everyday lives. And with apps like Facetune and Photoshop, it's becoming so much easier for even our families and friends to present this same kind of false perfection. And I think especially following the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, a lot of us were at home trying to stay connected. And this often happened through social media, apps like TikTok were absolutely exploding in popularity. And so we were kind of thinking, you know, what, what this impact would have on body image and perhaps how we see reality. And so I am the Women's on Non-Binary Officer um, this term at the Cambridge Union, um, K2. Um, and so we are talking with the, our Equalities Officer, Zara, um, and we thought that this might be a really you know, useful topic for us to talk about, especially with us kind of all being at the age where, you know, we're quite young, maybe easy to influence. And yeah, I'll hand over to Zara to introduce our speakers. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. So I'll start left to right. And then after, if you could give a quick introduction of your own as well, that would be great. So we have Neelam Gill. Um, Neelam is a British fashion model, TV personality and activist. She's been featured on Size Magazine, Harrods Magazine, Vogue India, and also worked in L'Oreal Commercials, Dior, Puma. Neelam is featured in the front page of Stylus Magazine um, and worked in various other commercials such as L'Oreal, Dior, Puma, and Western Union. She has spoken frequently about bullying, depression, and body confidence issues on her YouTube channel. Then we have the wonderful Adawa. Adawa is a highly motivated change maker, social justice educator, and freelance writer, currently the Inclusive Communities Manager at London Met University. She is well-versed and passionate about equality, diversity, inclusion, social mobility, and access, with a proven track record of translating this into initiatives and policy. She has bylines in Glamour, Galdem, The Independent, and Metro, and has over six years of project and event management experience. And last but not least, we have Amber Driscoll. Amber grew up in London, where she started modeling at 17 after winning her first modeling contract with the fashion brand Misguided. While studying at the University of Exeter, she continued to model, starring in campaigns for brands such as Reebok, Converse, Adidas, Superdry, Schwarzkopf, yeah, I should have practiced, um, and more. Uh, towards the end of 2019, Amber launched wellness community Bambi Collective, aimed at women of a similar age to herself. Across social media and via the Bambi Collective website, Amber and other members post about numerous topics, including body image, sex, relationships, and mental health, encouraging others to know about personal growth, how to be kinder to yourself, and providing a place to make new friends. So those are our three incredible speakers for tonight. I mean, do you briefly want to each go and give your own introduction of sorts? My name is Neelam Gill. Um, I'm a model and an activist. I started modeling when I was 18. I grew up in Coventry. Never thought I could become a model. Never dreamed of this being my life. It just kind of happened and I got scouted and I got thrown into this crazy industry. So along the way, I've, I've learned a lot and had to deal with a lot in the industry, like racism and tokenism and body image issues and just a barrage of stuff that I'm very passionate about talking about because I'm aware that with my job, there's this certain facade that comes with it. So I'm very passionate about being open and honest and sharing my struggles and hopes of helping others. Is that me? Yeah, it was uh, us. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Neelam. Um, so I'm Adra, Adra Darko. I um, have a nine to five in universities, quality and diversity work, um, but also on the side, do a lot of part time journalism work. Um, focusing on beauty and especially the experiences of black women or fat women and like the intersect of um, black plus size women's experiences. Um, and so it's great to be here and like I'm excited for the conversation. <laughs> Hi, I'm Amber Driscoll. Um, yeah, I started modeling when I was about 17 and then with modeling came um, kind of a big social platform on Instagram. And I used to post things that were more, uh, 
more filtered and less real. And I realized that that wasn't the kind of content that I personally enjoyed to seeing. Um, the kind of content that helped me was women that showed their bodies from the less flattering angles and showing talking about their body image problems. So then I started talking about that content in the, in the hopes that it helped other young women. And yeah, I just try and generally create a positive space on social media. But um, I think we're just going to begin with the questions now. Um, so Zahar, would you like to begin? So in what way have social media portrayals of body image affected you guys? Um, has social media influenced your idea of normal? And do you feel that social media perpetrates a particular beauty standard? So a Eurocentric, Eurocentric heteronormative one. And who do you feel suffers most from this? I mean, my mind automatically goes to Adwa to talk about this. So do you want to start? Um, <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, I think um, it's an interesting one. Um, I think my attitude towards this question has definitely changed and developed as I've kind of considered my own kind of social media identity and the way in which I use it and the way in which I'm more mindful about the content that um, I absorb and I engage with. Um, I think the beauty for me, I like to take this in a positive light and think the beauty for me is the fact that I've been able to carve out spaces and to be able to engage in spaces that I wouldn't have otherwise done, you know, growing up in like Milton Keynes and like very much having like a beauty standard which was incredibly white, incredibly slim, um, and of course all the other um, reflections of society I think that, are, that we'll definitely talk about um, through today. Um, and I think for me, like the in, um, the impact of kind of like black plus size women specifically who created the body positivity movement um, and don't often get acknowledged for the fact that they did do that and are the pioneers of that work um, have allowed me to kind of rethink and re um, consider what normal looks like and what it's like to you know be beautiful regardless of you know colorism telling you're not fat phobia telling you you're not white supremacy telling you that you're not yeah so personally like i think your question was how so has social media affected your own body image um so okay last week actually i got um, a new phone a google pixel and it had all my Google photos from when I had an Android when I was a teenager, where I switched to an iPhone when I was like 17. And so at the time I was on Tumblr when I was like around maybe 13 to 16. And it, I was looking through all the pictures from when I was that age and I was shocked because I had all these screenshots of, thing, of photos that I got from Tumblr and it was like glorifying anorexia and these 150 calorie a day diets that like literally 14 year old me was like screenshotting and like saying like, I'm gonna do this and like all these, various workout plans and thinspo of women that were literally stick thin, like like ribs and like thigh gaps and like glorifying that as the standard of beauty. And like, it's just, I was so sad for my teenage self thinking that when I was growing up, like not even through going, had not even finished going through puberty, that that's what I was looking at. Um, so yeah, and social media is I think an incredibly toxic place to be and I worry a lot about what teenagers now are going through even more because I think TikTok is a very dangerous place um, yeah do you have anything to add um yeah I, I it's difficult because it's such a, it's such a struggle because there's a big part of social media that I'm so grateful to be able to connect with people around the world and to have that sense of community and be able to talk to people directly you know your words don't get misconstrued people can see the real you or what you choose to put out there. And that's why I try and keep it authentic and honest. But then there's another side of it now with social media and scrolling. Um, I think with me, it's heightened because of my job of being a model that I always say it, like my body doesn't feel my own. And I think it was actually during lockdown because I had so much time to myself and I wasn't like flying and traveling that I had time to sit and reflect on all this and realize that I came into this so young at 18 already dealing with the pressures of, of becoming a model and having to go into my agency and feel demoralized to like take my clothes off in front of people and get your hips measured, which is, I don't think anyone should have to go through that, you know? And then you put yourself on social media and unfortunately it opens you to all these people's opinions and everyone deals with it, you know, whether it's like 
people leaving mean comments or you just feel judged and that's the aspect of social media that I don't like and that's why I try and be really open and honest about the way I feel or what I'm going through because I'm aware that it's a huge platform and a lot of young people especially now like when I first started modeling it wasn't a common job and now I think with the rise of social media people want to be a model they want to be a youtuber they want to be a social media influencer which I think is great I'm all for everyone doing what they want but I'm about making people aware that if you're going to do this job this is what comes with it it's not all glamorous and this is what you're going to be subjected to especially as a woman of color because it's, it's very difficult and you have you face struggles that your other white counterparts just they don't face so that's why i'm i'm passionate about being open and honest even about my own struggles with like depression anxiety um i've tried to lay it all out there open and honestly because my job is about selling an illusion when you open a magazine and you see a model you're presented a fantasy and actually we're all just human beings yeah absolutely i think that really covered some of the key you know, problems with social media. I mean, as you say, you know, there are positive ways of using it, but with this kind of pro Anna side of Tumblr, which has spread into TikTok, I think there is, I mean, I was wondering, do you think that because of social media, there's this specific type of perfection, like maybe something that's impossible to attain? Like, what, like what, what's your experience with this? I feel, feel it all the time. Like I actually feel naive sometimes. I remember um, I must have been like 21 and it was my first time going to Cannes Film Festival. I was so nervous, huge imposter syndrome. I was like my first big red carpet and I was with all these supermodels who I'd looked up to my whole life. And I was just thinking, why am I here? Like, why am I here? I don't deserve to be here. I'm just this girl from Coventry. Like, what am I doing here? And I remember we did the red carpet and I felt so naive because afterwards everyone was editing their pictures and it was the first time I'd even seen Facetune. And I remember thinking like, oh my God, this is how like everyone's pictures look so nice. Because I would think, how do people's pictures look like this? Mine don't look like this. Like, why am I so different? So I felt naive in that aspect. And I think people should be more transparent about what they do. That's why with me, I'm very open and honest. Like it's easy to look good when you've had your hair and makeup professionally done and you're on set and there's lighting team and there's an art director, but you don't look like that every day in real life. I don't look like that. And I think it's, it's unattainable to like push that image onto people who are so young and impressionable. It's not fair. Yeah, absolutely. Ado and Amber, do you have any thoughts on this? I don't know if it's a specific beauty standard because beauty standards always change but definitely just this culture of never being satisfied in the way you look like for example on TikTok like when there's when something comes up on my few page and it's just a girl like doing something I don't know and she's got like a really nice figure the comments will all be like what's your workout routine and what do you eat in a day and all things like oh I wasn't going to eat today anyway and it's just feeds into this narrative that like the way you look is never good enough and people are always striving to look like someone else and I just the, the mainstream narrative on social media is never one of like being accepting like, in the way you look and even just like the trend of what I eat in a day videos and like my workout routine it feeds into this like that when if you eat like this and you do my workout you can look like me and it's just yeah this toxic mindset that exists. I think you see it mostly in younger people um, nowadays and like I can't imagine I think for us kind of like of a similar age I can't imagine like the, the pressures that so many of the young people go through like they grew up like I grew up with like dream up moose and like one eyebrow pencil and I thought you know you're a bad bee like you're really you're doing things babe and like now I see like you know full-on like 12 year olds in school uniform with like contour and like wigs and like laid hair and all this stuff and I think um the pressure is just too much and like your skin is you know still you go still going through you know puberty you're still going through all the like you know terrible 
like times of like being a teenager and then you still have that added pressure of like YouTube videos and like socials and TikTok and everyone telling you that you should be looking a certain way when really everyone needs to go through their clap stage like everyone needs to go through through that it's part it's, it's character building you know it really is and the fact that they didn't go through that anymore I think it's like I was with my cousin yesterday and she's like all there with like you know edges and lashes and all sorts and I'm not saying that inherent there's anything wrong with that but if we inspect like what you know where those pressures are coming from what the like financial burden it is specifically on young women um it's something that i think that we should be inspecting and talking about a bit more yeah. completely completely and thank you so much for sharing that um just off the back of that i wanted to talk diet culture um amber i know this is something you're really passionate about um that's how i actually got into the whole anti-diet movement because of yourself um so i wanted to, to ask you what were your opinions on you know this massive presence of diet culture on social media and like the way it's hidden almost as well and like very like covert and do you think there should be tied to regulation on you know that sort of material percent and so one thing that really bothers me is influencers that have like a large platform and they're not qualified in any way to be talking about like nutrition or fitness. They're like fitness influencers, which is like fine in itself. But when they use like language that is very like insidious, like over a long period of time and when, when they're posting photos that get loads of likes because they have like an incredible figure but then they're posting their like workout plan and fitness like plan when they're not qualified to talk about it and there's language being thrown around like 12 week challenge or like before and after photos or things about getting like lean or just literally profiting off of people that want to look like them i yeah i think that it it, sh it shouldn't be a thing that's marketed to people but it, yeah Yeah, I mean, that point about, I I mean, I tweeted about this, like, um, I think about a year or so ago and got lots of backlash for it, but specifically around the question of before and after photos um, that you just talked about. And, like, for me, people should have autonomy, you know? Do what you want to do. And 100%, I think, also, like, it's frustrating because with these conversations, you always have to, like, preface it with all these disclaimers. And especially when you're a fat person yourself, you have to be like, oh, by the way, I still believe this X, Y, and Z. I'm not going to do that, can't be bothered. So what I would say is that why is it with before and after photos just that the before picture is always, like, a fat person or a plus-size person or a bigger person, like, you know, going through some kind of, like, deep sadness and they're wearing, like, just, like, joggers that don't fit them and they're just going through it. And then suddenly, once they've lost weight, they can go to the shard. Like, I don't understand. Like, all of a sudden, all of the after photos always them so glam. Like, they can always, you know, be in, like, some kind of glam location. They can suddenly be jetting off to Barbados and, like, everything is solved, including their social economic problems are all solved by like losing a few pounds um and i think that's just for me that's what the problem is is that they're so inherently like based in fat phobia and so inherently based in the fact that people see like being fat as like a, a stage like a pre-stage as opposed to recognizing like fat people's humanity and their own you know validity and, and taking up space quite literally um and i think that's what the problem lies for me in that in that discourse you know like people's lives shouldn't be just about the like about waiting to become the after you know I'm going to interrupt because I know we had a program, but I'm interested now. Um, I was going to ask, I know, Amber, you've spoken about this as well, but like, you know, the body positive positivity movement, how it's almost been like hijacked by thin people in a way. And like you have like these very conventionally attractive thin women like posing in front with their belly rolls showing or, or whatnot. I mean, I wanted to ask, how do you think we can create a space for everyone in the body positivity movement? For me, I think it's important to distinguish between body positivity and body confidence because like, there's a difference between what I post about, which is talking about my own body image problems and my personal experiences, and then the body positivity movement, which was created by black women and is more about the marginalization of black fat bodies in societies and the repercussions 
of that and how people treat them rather than personal body image. And I think it's important yet yeah, to distinguish between the two and also not necessarily assume that any person that is, like, for example, I've received negative comments when it's literally just a photo of me with a bloated belly saying, like, I've got a food baby and people, like, I've had people attack me saying, like, you can't talk about body positivity, but I'm like, I'm not. I didn't even use the phrase. I'm just talking about my experience. So I think as long as women, well, thin women aren't using that phrase and trying to literally be part of the body positivity movement, then I think it's, yeah, it's just important to differentiate between the two. Do you have anything to add to that, like with your experience in modeling? And I think with my experience with modeling, it's so difficult because like I said, it's such a facade that when you do start to speak up about your struggles, a lot of people don't want to hear it because they just think, well, you have this perfect glamorous life and you shouldn't complain and you fit the, the beauty standard of wider society. But I didn't feel that way growing up. You know, I'm a Punjabi girl, I'm Indian. I grew up in a Sikh family. I grew up feeling so out of place and very skinny in my community. You know, even now, if I go home, my nanny will try and feed me and cry. Like sometimes she honestly, at Christmas, she cried because she's like, you're so skinny. Who's going to marry you? Oh my gosh, you're so tall. You're taller than all the boys. So there's always a different beauty standard. And I grew up feeling very insecure about my body. I, I never liked to show it off. I was just very insecure about the way I looked in general. And then you become a model and people expect all your problems to be solved. Well, actually your trauma is heightened because one day you're being told that you're perfection. The next day you're telling, your agent's telling you that you need to lose two inch off your hips. And then you have someone in social media saying this about you. Then you have Daily Mail comments ripping you to shreds and saying loads of racist abuse. So I had to get to a place where I realized there's always going to be an opinion. Always. Even if I'm happy with myself, like there will always be someone who doesn't like the way I look. And that's why it may sound weird, but because of my job, but I had to learn to place my importance outside of my body and my looks. And I know that may sound so cheesy, but it's true because it's like, I am so much more than the way I look. And I don't want to be defined by the way I look, which I know could sound ironic because of my job. But if this is me talking from a place where like my appearance has been ripped to shreds under a microscope, then I, I don't know. I just think as a, as a society, it makes me upset that it is shoved down our throat so much, the importance of our appearance, because I think there's so many more interesting things that like we possess as human beings. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I was just thinking, you know, talking about all of these pressures, you know, do you think there are any particular demographics, maybe age-wise or gender-wise, that are, would be affected by this and maybe what it is in particular about social media. So, for example, comments or editing or follow accounts that make this, that, that creates such pressure. I don't know, maybe Neelam, do you have any? Uh, I think as someone who's in the industry or if you have a platform, if you're on social media, I think everyone has a certain responsibility to just, just be honest and truthful. And I think everyone should have a moral code that they stand by. You know, um, I've noticed like a lot of people do amazing work at calling people out and talking about how what they're doing is so disruptive to young people and, and on their body image. And that's why I think you have to stick by a certain moral code. There's certain things I would never do. I would never promote anything to do with like diets or um, pills or supplements to take or these like gummies. And even when it comes to my own community, I would never, ever promote skin lightening or anything to do, which is a huge industry in India that most people get paid a lot of money for, but I would just never touch that because you have to have a certain conscious and you have to be aware of who is following you and who is supporting you. And majority of that are young, impressionable people. Yeah, I think, I think it's hard. I think like everyone kind of plays in, like plays into it because it's just part of this bigger thing of social media of feeling like we have to show our best selves all the time or like the best versions of our lives and from the best angles. And so everyone, it's it's really hard to actually step beyond that. And because it's it can, it can be quite scary and quite vulnerable to share parts of yourselves that aren't as like, you know, what, what you would find attractive or 
you know, the things that, yeah, that are hard to talk about because everyone else is showing the best versions of themselves. So, yeah, it's scary. So everyone else kind of feeds into it. And so even though, like, some, sometimes like, I, when I'm on, like, certain people's pages, I'm like, I just, it, this, I could, I could imagine seeing this from, like, a teenager's point of view and thinking, and imagine how horrible I would feel about myself. And I'm like, I wish everyone would just show that they don't look like this all the time or not try and post the most flattering angles or posing in a certain way. But then also I feel a bit sorry for people because it's like, well, you're also under this illusion and trap that you need to be showing this best version of yourself. So it's just trying to, like, as many people as possible, trying to re re change that narrative and change the way we use social media. Like it's not a highlight reel. Um, yeah. I just wanted to shift the conversation a bit and ask, like, in the nuances of social media and body image, how do you think it advances Eurocentric beauty standards? Um, because arguably, I don't know if you're aware of the recent black fishing scandal with Jesse Nelson. Um, arguably, you know, it seems like a really inclusive space and like, oh, you know, like, if anything, that shows she's interested in like, you know, like that, like, all sort of ways of looking different are celebrated but but I think it's rooted in something more sinister as well because the, people do say it's cultural appropriation I mean I have a quote here from Priya Alan of The Guardian saying um Adawa, I'd like you to speak about this being black is cool unless you're actually black I mean what do you have to say about that and black fishing and you know the intricacies of Eurocentricism in, in social media um I think I can't remember who wrote this um, so forgive me, but I do feel like it's more, I think speaking specifically, so also background, I'm a, I'm a hardcore Little Mix fan, like I'm a hardcore Little Mix fan, like I've seen them on concerts so many times, so this, this topic is painful for me, so please bear, bear with me. Um, but the, just speaking specifically about the Jesse Nelson case, and also a lot of kind of similar artists, um, I think it's more insidious than purely seeing it as black fishing, is the co-opting of like a very specific type of black identity, which also feeds into other tropes that also oppress other types of black people. So specifically, what she's done is kind of emulated that kind of light skin, um, video vixen almost kind of um, imagery, which um, within the black community is probably described as the beauty standard. And I think then perpetuating that even further is what's, what's, what, where the problem really lies, is because not only like that you're talking about, you know, taking away black okay, culture and black identity, is the fact that you're also perpetuating something which is harmful within that. Um, I think the problem is ultimately like playing into these tropes, playing into these stereotypes, playing into these narratives without actually facing the ramifications for it. Um, I saw this clip from like Rita Ora the other day. Like I, it shocks me every single day that Rita Ora is not black. Like it shocks me so much. I'm like, oh my gosh, like, like, like who, like who is your makeup artist? Who is your hairdresser? Because they need to be coming to me because it, it's wild. Um, but she was saying about how, and she was just joking about it, but I thought it was a really actual like moment for me in understanding and she was saying that she likes the fact that people don't know where she's from and she benefits from that racial ambiguity because that's what sells sells her records um, and I think that's what the crux of the issue is is for me and it's about again pandering to even like intercultural you know um, beauty standards. Identity. Have, have you ever felt like you need to play up to like racial ambiguity or like be exotic or yeah when I first started modeling like I said I was very naive and new to the industry and I remember I had so many people tell me just just don't tell someone where you're from or like I'd go to castings and a photographer would be like are you Brazilian are you are you half this and I'd be like no I'm Punjabi like I'd, I was very proud of where I came from um but I also think because I was the first Indian model for so many brands that then I was like stamped with that from a young age, you know, but I also dealt with kind of classism in the industry of the fact that I'm working class and this is an industry that's mainly dominated by privilege and it, I kind of view it as this like 
I don't know, it's kind of like a secret society, like everyone knows everyone. So when I first came in this, I was so young and naive and knew nothing about it. And I dealt with classism in the sense of, I remember my first agency telling me, don't tell people you're from Coventry, because it's not glamorous. Like, tell people you're from Leamington Spa. But I was like, but I'm not from there. I'm from Coventry, why not? I didn't understand. So I think there's, there's a lot of that in the industry of, of hiding your true self. And I think it goes back to what I was saying in the beginning about being a model and selling this, this illusion and this fantasy. Whereas now I think the narrative is shifting in that there's power in being exactly who you are, raw and unfiltered. And there will be people who are always gonna say things, but people will gravitate towards that honesty. Yeah, sorry, I'm just um, coming in here because I saw um, the TED talk that you gave, which was amazing. And I think something that you were talking about, you know, in terms of being this, you know, the first, you know, first British Indian model they write in a lot of headlines and then feeling, feeling maybe, you know, a bit fragile sometimes when you're kind of painted out as a, you know, yeah, like break, breaking through, you know, how, how do you cope with kind of being this figure that's meant to be breaking boundaries and, you know, going against maybe the grain of what's seen as, you know, perfect on social media or in the media in general? I think the pressures of being a young person in general, whether you're in this industry or whether you're studying or whether you have a nine to five, they're immense. You know, living in the society we're living in, it's, it's huge pressure on all of us. And I think for me, I, I definitely felt that. Like I said to you earlier, I grew up in a very small place. I grew up not feeling good about myself, being extremely insecure the way I looked and self-harming and hating the way I looked to then being completely praised at 18 and put on this pedestal as being the first Indian model, which half of me was amazed and couldn't believe I was there. But the other half of me was like, when is this going to end? Because I'm just this girl from Coventry and it's all going to finish tomorrow and I'm going to have to go home and go back to my normal life and work in Hollister like I was, you know, in Birmingham. So I really like have gone through it all in the industry and that's why it, I've always been open and honest because I couldn't hide it. It's very difficult to, to do things in the public and to be on red carpets and hide your emotions. I've been depressed, suicidal at certain points, been in an abusive relationship that I, I had to hide from the world. And it made me feel so ashamed because I was being praised at that time for being the first Indian model for L'Oreal. And I was doing all these covers and people would tell me I was such an inspiration. And inside, I just hated myself because I think I'm not strong. I'm not brave. I'm actually, this is what's happening to me behind closed doors. And it made me a complete recluse. And I think through just age and growing up and my own journey of healing, it made me realize that all of those things make me who I am. And actually speaking about these things and, and being human has made, has like kind of created this community. And I'm happy that people see me this way. I don't want to be seen as this picture perfect model who has everything together. I think life and the complexities and the ups and downs are, are what makes us who we are. Thank you so much um, for talking about that. And I just wanted to ask you all as well, you know, um, if you are feeling fragile or if you do you know, have a picture that you like, but maybe, I don't know, maybe you've got a sunburn and you want it in black and white, you know, what extent do you think to what extent do you think that it's okay to be editing your pictures? Do you think it's ever kind of acceptable? I edit my photos. I don't think there's ever like a justifiable reason to do that. Maybe like for brightness or something, but like not like actually editing what's in there. Because then it's like, where's the line? Um, yeah. um, I just love the fact of that. Do you post particular photos? This is for everyone. Um, and just the idea about like posting for validation or what, what do you post for? But do you post particular photos that make you feel good about your body? And what are your thoughts when posting a photo about your body? I mean, Amber, that seems like a natural, but yeah. So, like, this is like quite tricky because sometimes like I will be in like a mind space where like I, <laughs> I want to post the version of myself that looks like the the best kind of version. So like I do, but then I also post a version where I don't look as good. Or sometimes like because like I'm like a thin woman that talks about my body issues, like the the like I, 
the first the post the photos I post where like people relate the most to the ones where I'm like bloated, for example. So then when I post a photo of me in a bikini where like I'm not bloated and I just like look look you like I can do like with a fairly flat stomach, then I feel a little bit guilty because I'm like, well, is this then going to affect people's judgment of me? Are they thinking that I'm posting the fact that I'm trying to post the best version of myself? So. Yeah, I don't know. It's hard. Um, I try to always post the not the good and the bad, but yeah, I think I do have a responsibility to share like all versions of myself. I think I come at it from a different um, perspective. I think because um, I'm not an, a model or an influencer, and so um, I think that my relationship to my socials is quite different. Um, but I think I had a moment. I remember so. I, I mean, obviously, I'm still trying to post what's the best, like, what the best version of Aj is, you know. But at the moment, I had a friend tell me one time, she was like, oh, your Instagram, like, it's so, it's so, like, unapologetic. And, like, I know she meant it definitely as a compliment. Then I was reflecting on it, like, later, and I was thinking about some of the, comp- um, some of the compliments that specifically people with marginalised bodies um tend to receive so it's the kind of thing that's also similar things like when I go to like a club bathroom or something and like there's a babe who always wants to tell me like you honestly you're so beautiful and you're so brave and you're so this da, da, da. just because I'm wearing like a bodycon dress that shows my tummy right she's like oh my god like do you know you're so beautiful I'm like babe like that's why I came here like I'm I know I'm paying like that's why that's why I'm here like yeah I don't, you don't need to give me this talk right now like I don't um but it's this idea that you know when you're just living in a marginalized body, everything you do becomes like a statement of some kind or, the, or something for, like for there to be discourse around. When really I was just out with my girls like having a good time or I just posted this picture of me in a milkshake and suddenly it's like, wow, you're really fighting against diet culture. And we, I just like five guys, like it's not really, it's not really a big deal. Um, and I just think, yeah, it's just interesting um, that, like yeah that extension I've got like lots of friends who are um kind of like plus size influencers or plus size models and like it's just interesting to see the kind of like comments that come out and the kind of yes queen vibes that tends to go with a lot of marginalized people people from trans communities queer people like always are seem to be getting these you know weird you think that you're like why is it that you're so like zoning in on like my living my life in the mo- in the same way like if you saw like a, a like a thin white woman drinking a milkshake you're just gonna see a thin white woman drinking a milkshake you know completely and i mm. to go off the back of that why do you i mean we touched on body neutrality neelam you talked about it and amber i know you're big on that as well um what is body neutrality to you guys and how do you think it can help the way you know social media has changed for the better um, I mean, hmm. do you, yeah, do you, want, do, you want, do you want to go first with this one? This is, yeah, I have, yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Okay, so for me, body neutrality is, it's not loving your body 24-7 and like the whole, your body is beautiful, like, what do you mean? Like, you don't like your body, like, you're perfect. It's not that, it's like always having this respect for your body and everything it does for you and always just trying to respect it and it's because it it's accepting that you are sometimes going to have bad body image days like I think it's pretty unrealistic to be like you should wake up every day and love the way you look Mm -hmm. um but always yeah just respecting your body and not resorting to negative self-talk or like toxic behaviors like you know deciding to skip a meal or purging or like binging or anything like that and so it's just always having that foundation of respect for your body and just taking the value out of the way it looks and it's like my body is not an ornament it allows me to do all these incredible things and remembering that that's your body's purpose it's not meant to be something that's nice to look at um yeah i really like the point he said about like having like a base 
of like respect for your body and um, I think I really engage with like that as an ideal I think it's difficult again like talking back to people with different forms of like um marginalized bodies whether that be like disability or that be and then of course like fatness feeds into ableism and all that stuff anyway when like their structure like your body is the, because of your body you are facing structural oppression I think it's difficult then to kind of have that mutual when constantly you're reminded in wherever space you go that the world isn't made for you, like physically isn't made for you. And I think that's where, like, I think it's, it's difficult to, like, not want to correct that with the sense of, like, body positivity and it's, like, purist and it's, like, original sense, which is very much about, you know, um, championing, you know, like, um, marginalised bodies. But I think that it would be a great base for everybody to have that attitude, I think, towards, you know, themselves. And just be kind to yourselves, I think, ultimately. And I think this is the, the discourse that came out of the pandemic and, like, the whole kind of, like, pandemic lockdown bodies and all that stuff. Like, your bodies have literally, like, carried you, I mean, hopefully, fingers crossed, like, IJN, all that, like, through, like, a pandemic, you know? We've been through so much. So many of us have gone, actually physically gone through coronavirus or gone through whatever, and you're still going to be, like, angry because you've put on, like, some pounds or some stones or whatever it is instead of actually like acknowledging that you know the sheer like amount that it goes through to be able to allow you to wake up every morning um i think it's something to to be happy about fingers crossed yeah i think just thinking about that point and you know talking about marginalized bodies as well i think this is kind of something that comes from you know, society, you know, you know, and experiences as well. And I was wondering whether you feel like as a child, maybe you had a different kind of body image, whether you think social media has changed maybe your biases or preconceived ideas about your body, you know, like how social media has affected your, you know, and developed your body image over time. Yeah, so I just jumped in, <laughs> jumped in there. Um, but I think I've been thinking about this a lot recently. Um, there was an article that came out which was about, um, like, it was, I don't, I don't think it was an OG, I interpreted it as a but it was pretty much like talking about the experience or the, um, the representation, I'd say, of plus size black women, specifically mostly um, African American women on screen, and that whole idea of like them being like kind of like the fat sidekick in so much of like specifically black comedy. And I was thinking about it very much as like when I was like kind of growing up and like what people like always been like a plus size kid obviously always been a black kid of the um yeah and like just watching you know the representations that i had and like how people who look like me were always like the punchline of um of of media like that was the only time that you saw anyone plus size of black women she was some kind of punchline she was deeply hypersexualized dehumanized pandered into like some old like kind of um deeply um even like tropes like relating back to like slavery in terms of like mammy figures and all sorts that um very much um you know was represented like stuff like stuff which is like so just like when i look back to like things like norbit which was like eddie murphy in like in a fat suit it was just it was a shambolic like absolutely shambolic um, so I think for me, the beauty is like, I think then like when Facebook came and I started seeing like the, ver the very early like YouTube influencers and the very early plus size spaces and seeing actually like, you know, these women don't have to wear like, you know, like <laughs> raggedy clothes and like butterfly hem floral gowns like all the time. And there's actually spaces for like um, specifically plus size black women um or any form of um plus size people to actually be able to thrive and actually look good and you know feel good about themselves i think was definitely a game changer in terms of my own um relationship to my own self and my relationship to my own body and my relationship to other people's and other people who looks like me's um body as well so yeah in many ways of course it is a deeply terrifying terrifying space but i think also i'm deeply thankful for what it's done um in terms of 
like it doesn't exist in a vacuum, but there is a sense of democratization that exists in social media um, that I think is, is fantastic. Whether, Amber, maybe you have any thoughts on that with your kind of Bambi collective group as well in creating a space? I think because we can't just be like social media is bad, like we need to get rid of it because obviously there is so much good that it does. And so, yeah, for example, I created Bambi Collective because I wanted to create, like if you're going to use, you know, the internet or social media, like it'd be nice, like I want young women to feel like they have a safe space, like even if it's just like our little group, like it's, so on, like, for example, the Facebook group, there's, like, 7,000 girls and they can, like, post about whatever they want and, like, just feel free to talk about what they want without judgment or, um, yeah, I think, yeah, creating positive spaces online is really important and also spreading the word about those various groups. Um, just, yeah, and also because people are on their phones so much, like, I think a lot of people don't realise that they are, like, kind of, positive spaces because so many people just scroll kind of mindlessly um so yeah teaching people that you can use social media in a positive way i agree definitely with your point of um stereotypes being enforced i mean i didn't grow up seeing much of me in the mainstream media and the things that i did see i think riz Ahmed spoke about this like quite eloquently. I, I don't know if he wrote something for The Guardian talking about stereotypes within acting of him having to go out for roles of a terrorist and speaking about how the narrative needs to be changed around roles in, in mainstream Hollywood. But that also bleeds into my industry of fashion and social media of growing up and not seeing anyone who looks like me in ads or on TV. And that's why now I feel so passionate about breaking barriers and boundaries in my industry not just for ego and for personal gain but because it's important to feel seen and heard i think that's why now the rise of like influencers or like you said when you saw your first like youtubers that you felt you connected with because you have that moment and you're like oh my god it's not just me i'm not just alone i'm not the only one going through this so that's why i think it's so important to to talk about these things and to create space and, and make noise while you're doing it Sorry. And I think, um, um, just to kind of have one more question before I think we need to start, well, we should start talking about like how we can go forward and use social media more positively. Um, so just kind of how you think the pandemic might have affected, you know, body image, maybe how people see themselves with all these posts about maybe weight gain, weight loss, and, and also just the dependence on social media. Does anyone? I think I'll start with this because I've seen a huge shift especially through the pandemic because i think it made people much more aware and socially conscious because we had so much time at home and in a way i find it kind of ironic because it's like i'm seeing the same casting directors who are telling me to go on a juice cleanse and telling me you know when i was tiny to basically not eat and starve myself in order to fit into these sample sizes and now i'm seeing them being woke <laughs> and on social media you know praising these type of girls and trying to be inclusive and and booking a range of models for shows which i think is great and i understand everyone has to go through their journey but it's like i question how genuine is it you know i think now especially in my industry of fashion big brands are scared they're aware that they cannot keep using the same thin white girl as a model like that is not the average consumer it's not people like i said want to feel seen and heard and i think that's why the industry is becoming more diverse in that sense i would hope there are a few rare designers out there who really stand by their ethos like olivier at bauman i think he's always championed diversity but i think a lot of them are kind of filling a quota because they are scared of getting cancelled or they're scared of like being on diet prada and getting called out so I've definitely seen the shift of that during the pandemic of the the big, you know, influential people in the industry realizing how things have to change and that a lot of it, their ideals are just archaic and they need to move with the times or they're just they're not going to make money and people won't support them. I think that, well, like I like everyone at the start of the pandemic that hadn't already had TikTok downloaded TikTok. And I think that the pandemic really it 
made a lot body image a lot worse i think in like for most people um like during that first lockdown there was this whole chloe ting workout trend thing and it was all these girls doing these workouts and then being like it was it was specifically hourglass workout challenge like i love fitness and i think but like there's a difference between promoting fitness for like the sake of all the all the like many many benefits it has beyond like like the way it affects your physical body um but it was sp specifically focusing on how to get an hourglass figure and then girls can saying oh this isn't working i'm switching to this workout because like the chloe ting one actually like works your oblique so like you're actually gaining like more muscle and like your waist is getting wider and i don't want that like um and then i like i feel like downloading tiktok set me back five steps because at least with instagram it was you have control over who you follow and what you see even though now actually you don't really because they've added this feature into your feed where you're scrolling where it shows suggested posts posts from people you don't follow which is and I'm like who are these people that like I haven't like vetted like I like to follow people because I know they're going to have a positive impact on me and I like what they're sharing and now I'm like this is really annoying so the same way with TikTok like the few pages just stuff you you don't know what you're seeing and that, the way the algorithm works like when I was looking at these videos I was kind of looking at it from a stance of like I want to see what's out there not because I want to like lose weight and do these challenges so then I was getting more and more of this content and it was just so really scary and i was thinking of the people that are engaging in this content because they want to because they're trying to lose weight or fit this aesthetic and i was just imagining like the rabbit hole that they're in and it just gets worse and worse the more you engage and it's just that becomes like your world on social media um and i think that's really scary and like facebook admitted like in their own reports that were leaked that they know that Instagram has a negative effect on like mental health, body image, depression. Like they're aware that it does that because of the way that their algorithm like, works and the way they push content, but like they're not doing anything about it because like the longer you, they just they just want you to stay on the app because the longer you're on the app, the more money they make. So they feed you the videos you're going to engage with, but they don't well they know the damage it has and they're not doing anything about it. So yeah, I think it's definitely accelerated people's body image problems. If not given a whole new generation of girls, like it's planted this seed that they're going to like spend years and years of their life trying to hopefully even if they have a realization that what they're doing like is damaging, if they ever have that realization or trying to or spending years of their life trying to rebuild that positive self-esteem and change the way that they want to well, the way that they see themselves. I also think yeah I think um that for the first time a lot of people had to grapple with their own internalized fat phobia and like their own I think obviously like naturally people are moving less eating more ordering in like I remember like like Uber Eats and delivery were like cashing in like definitely through that pandemic and like people for the first time probably had to face up with the fact that they would put on like considerable amounts of weight um and I think what was interesting to me is like as a person who's always been plus size is like seeing how people coped with that and seeing how people started to speak and the specific disdain that they had towards their bodies which reflected against their kind of attitudes towards you know um not only it's not reflective of just themselves but reflective of their attitudes towards you know fat bodies in general um and things so i think it was it was definitely interesting to see difficult at times to see that people could be so deeply harsh to themselves and stuff that they could say about their own selves and their own bodies going back to that point about being kind to, to your body for the fact that it's put allow like allowed you to do so much um but yeah it was definitely i think it is so fine to be unhappy you know it's so fine to look in the mirror and not you know feel like be like oh yeah you you're doing great or you're unhappy with putting on putting on weight it's completely fine but i think the specific language that people use which was reflective of you know the like the stain that they have for specific, specifically for for you know being plus size or being fat um that i think was was definitely 
um, a theme, I think, through, through the pandemic. Thank you so much. It's amazing to have your perspectives on that and kind of now thinking about all the problems that we've discussed, I kind of thought maybe the best way for us to end this before maybe opening up to Q&A if we have time um, is just to kind of ask how you would recommend coping with things like the easy comparisons and diet culture and social media and maybe you know what how you would change the way we post or use social media to make it more of a force for good rather than you know making us feel worse encourage people especially within my industry to be more honest because you have to be self-aware and you have to realize the stereotype and the stigma that comes with with this job and being a model and I think being open and honest and and sharing not being so obsessed with having this picture perfect life you know not and that doesn't mean that that you can't post pictures that aren't nice but maybe it's about like going on your stories and opening up or for me it's like when I did my TED talk and I spoke about being in an abusive relationship and people couldn't believe I went through that at a time where I was probably like the most successful in my career but it's about owning everything you go through and I think like I said especially in my industry it's been like social media has allowed models to have a voice before social media we were kind of mannequins that you're seen and you're not heard um, I think even with Kate Moss, like a lot of people have never even heard her speak. She doesn't do many interviews. Whereas now models are being, you know, vocal and they're speaking about what they're passionate on. And I think that's amazing. And I think more people should, should stand out and do that. Yeah, I think um, being more mindful about what you engage with, I think is key. Um, there's no need to follow accounts or follow things that don't make you happy or don't, you know, speak to you, um, your, you know, your well-being. Um, and I think also connected to that is that follow people like who, like f follow marginalised people, like educate yourself, like educate yourself on people who don't look like you or who are undergoing like some kind of, you know, structural oppression based on the way in which they they look or navigate the world um and i think that like allow it to be you know as to say like a positive and mindful mindful space for you i think first of all like a big thing for me was like reading books about diet culture and then realizing oh my god like and then like realizing this kind of these lies I've been told and the way diet culture permeates like every bit of society so I think education is so important like for example if you're struggling with body image like two books I would recommend it one is anti-diet and one is okay no, I can't remember that one but mm -hmm. um yeah reading about it and then you're able to actually recognize when you're being like sold diet culture or, through social media um, and able to recognize certain language or accounts that like partake in it so then you can learn what accounts to follow or unfollow and yet be mindful in what you engage with like you don't you don't have to follow accounts that look pretty just because they look pretty like I used to follow like a bunch of people because they were like beautiful but like actually that wasn't good for me like I think we just think we should just follow like beautiful people which is like fine but if like they don't make you feel good then just unfollow and also like if you can, it's catching yourself like scrolling like and once you start like catching yourself and then just like taking a break um and yeah being very mindful of the way you consume but it's like really hard because i think for a lot of young people like they have fomo if they're like not posting on tiktok and because tiktok is like the big one and you can't control what you're seeing so I think yeah, education is a big part of it because and hopefully being strong enough to not get sucked into comparing yourself and being jealous of other people. But it's really difficult, I think. Thank you so much, guys, for all your insights. They're so incredibly valuable. Um, I think we'll open up to the floor. We have time for a couple of questions, I think. Why is it if a fat person just posts a photo, we have to have a discourse about health? 
You know, health is a very complex photo. Um, it's a very, very complex picture. It's so many things feed into that. You won't be able to see a human being. You can't look at me. You can think, make assumptions about my BMI and all that stuff, which I'm not, I'm not a medic. There's probably medics here. We're in big, big Cambridge who can analyze that far better than I can. So I'm not even going to try. But I think as, um, I think for me, people deserve to be seen as beautiful. People deserve to be seen um, as valid. People deserve to navigate their lives in the way they see fit without it always having to be reduced to this conversation about health. You know, they, it's, it just, it's not, it's never, for me, it rarely is about health. What we're saying is that we don't like the way that you look and we feel like there's a moral deficit here and that if you've allowed yourself to get to this point, there's something wrong with you and I'm doing the right thing by actually, you know, saying to you, yeah, babe, I know you're here with your friends or you're, you know, posting again your milkshake or whatever it is, um, but I'm going to now take the, take the focus away and start talking about something that I, first of all, have no expertise on don't know you from Adam and don't actually have a like a vested interest in your in your progression in any way, shape or form. Um I just think that it's um it's just reflective of yeah, of just deep and deep, deep, deep structural fat phobia. I hope that answers your question, but as I say, mm -hmm. I, that's that's a big one. Yeah. Like is it then like it wouldn't be okay or to some people it's not and i was wondering if it kind of like can sometimes make you like fixate on your body in a way that's not healthy as well did a post on this um, because I went through the exact same thing as you, I had stretch marks my whole life. I never thought anything about them. I just thought they were normal and a part of me. And it was actually during Cannes and I was about to go to the, on my first red carpet, I was so nervous and I was wearing this backless dress and someone from the team who I was like working with at the time stopped me and someone pretty senior there and was like, oh, you can't go out. And I was like, why? You know, like I've just spent two hours getting ready. And she's like, oh, we need more makeup on, on your stretch marks. And I was like, what? I was so confused because I was like, how is this a thing? Like, this is another thing to add to the list of like, why I'm not perfect in your eyes. So in that moment before then, I was completely like you bewildered. I didn't realize that this was meant to be a, a flaw. And I never posted about it making a big deal about it and I think once I posted a picture in a bikini and I got so many comments of people being like wow I you're so brave for showing your stretch marks like kudos to you and I thought huh like I'm so confused but when I realized that it would actually help a lot of people by me speaking out about it especially with my job where that same day in Cannes where I did that red carpet that brand photoshopped my stretch marks out yeah even though I said I don't need them covered up by makeup it's fine like I'll just go they photoshopped it out the image for me and that made me feel so confused because I was like what's wrong with me like I thought I looked great I mean for once I was happy with myself you know that's an achievement in itself so when I posted the bikini picture and I got all these comments from women and young people it made me realize like I have a responsibility to talk out about it and I was just honest and I said I never thought this was a flaw my whole entire life I thought it was so normal I didn't bat an eyelid when it came to it but actually a lot of people have been made to feel that this is a bad thing and especially in like the new beauty standard I see so many people promoting like these crazy like injections that you can get to get rid of like stretch marks and scarring and all this stuff and yeah I just I just posted that and it, it got a great response and I think it also just opened the the conversation on on that matter as well. I feel like there's so much like negativity that exists online that like any post that's like being like positive or like happy about like body 
parts that people may be like insecure about like even if it's something that like you personally were never insecure about like it's obviously something that people have learned to be insecure about so I kind of think that any I think any I think that yeah there's so much negativity negativity online that like I'm happy for any account that's like trying to do anything positive you know like yeah Questions? Elliot? <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Um, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about sort of what your thoughts are about the responsibilities of social media companies and all of this. Um, whilst it's been touched on, I feel like, you know, they are not necessarily the kind of architects of, you know, a whole society, but they definitely exacerbate a lot of the problems that we're talking about. Definitely have a responsibility, like, for example, like what I was talking about with the leaked um, research they did into how Facebook and Instagram impacts like teenage mental health. I think it was a statistic. That I'm, I may be wrong, but it was something about they know that they like they've introduced like body image to like two out of five girls or something like that, um, like negative body image. Um, and so that was like from the Facebook whistleblower, and she was talking about how these companies know that they could create a version of these platforms if they decided to have maybe like a few billion less in profit each year and it would be like an app that you would engage more with your family and friends and you wouldn't but it wouldn't you wouldn't be on it all the time because it wouldn't be like this slot machine where you're always trying to scroll and get some kind of like reward because it would just be being used for the purpose it was kind of made for originally which was to be in touch with family and friends or the content you kind of want to engage with oh, but then that's like not the content you want to engage with because then that's like a whole thing about the algorithm so yeah i think they need to be less profit focused because they know the impact that they're having and they can't be so naive as to say like well like that's not our responsibility because they know that it is and they know that it's having a real impact so i think yeah there does need to be regulation and for them to actually think about their morals and how they are affecting people. So hopefully, yeah, an app that has a less, uh, what's the word, like an algorithm that is not trying to suck you in as much. I don't, I don't really know what the solution is. I think they, they know that they've created a problem and it's their responsibility to fix it. I think it's so deeply rooted into just like the themes of our society of of being a woman especially growing up I mean okay I grew up maybe with the rise of Instagram but I was on MSN with my friends like logging on to talk to all my friends after school but even then at that age I was like obsessed with watching like E and all these like reality shows and then that became my beauty standard and I was obsessed with like magazines at that time because that's what I had access to so I think social media is kind of like a natural evolution of that of realizing but unfortunately like we do live in a world that profits off insecurities whether it's with young women whether it's with men whether it's with everyone you know every and that's what's really unfortunate um and I think it's about being aware of it. I wish I had the answers to know how to combat that, especially with what you said about you not being on social media as much, but then still feeling that pressure. My sister, she's in university too, and she's the same. She suffers a lot with anxiety and she was on social media, especially when she first joined to try and like make friends and be cool and go out together and take group pictures of their nights out. And she just realized I can't do this. Like it feels impossible and it's not making me feel good about myself. So she's kind of removed herself from it, but then it's that thing of FOMO or feeling like, am I the odd one out or am I missing out? So it's so difficult because it's easy for us to sit here and give advice of like, be really mindful and, and don't look at it. But unfortunately it's in our everyday lives. Like even if you're watching Netflix, you'll see the person there scrolling on Instagram or taking a selfie. 
So it's like, it's kind of scary to me that this, this has become like the new normal. But I think it's about finding things that you can still disconnect with and make yourself feel good, if that makes any sense. Do you guys have anything to add or? Yeah, I think just like as a society, we've been taught as women to like view each other as competition and like we like women have just been so hyper sexualized that like, yeah, and you know, yeah, way before social media, like, profiting off of our insecurities is like a billion, billion dollar industry. And it's realizing that women aren't like sometimes like we all struggle with seeing another woman that's like got a figure that maybe you wish you had or like you, you know, you, you get envious of some trait but then it's like realizing that actually like she's just another girl that's like beautiful and like she probably looks at other people and thinks like oh I wish I looked like that but it's just accepting that like we are who we are and just a fundamental like acceptance of the way you are and it's okay to like compare yourself to people because it's so so hard not to but I think it's like training yourself to have like a second voice that like the first thought that you had doesn't mean that that has to be like what is what you really think like catch yourself thinking like oh like god I wish like that I wish like that and then think actually no like because you know she's just she's a beautiful woman so am I like I don't have to be she's not my competition I don't have to be envious of her and just slowly kind of training your mind to just believe that like who you are is enough but like yeah it's, it's really hard um I wanted to ask, obviously you work in these industries, so modelling, social media, and how is it working in it, but at the same time criticising it? Do you sometimes feel like you're almost complicit in it, but then also challenging it? And are there any parts of it that you really appreciate and that you like about it? Because you're obviously still on social media, still modelling. There's something about it that you're drawn to. And yeah, I, I just wanted to hear about that. And I do kind of resonate with that in other ways. Like, for example, being in Cambridge, I know that I'm complicit in certain things that I might disagree with. But at the same time, there's so much about it that I appreciate. So, yeah, I was just wondering what you thought about that, because I feel like that can apply to so many different situations. Thank you. So I think that's a really amazing question, because it's something that I've pondered on for a long time and it's something that I struggled with a lot in the beginning of just this feeling of guilt of being in this industry but I think it's about mindfulness you know there's a lot about the industry that I completely despise and I think is very wrong and I'm vocal about it but then there's another side where I love the industry and I love um, being able to meet people from all over the world it's expanded my ma mind I've been able to travel but I also think it's important, like I said earlier, to take up space. Like there's a large part of the industry I believe needs to change and hopefully slowly it is. But just because I dislike it, should I like abandon the industry completely because I don't agree with it? No, I stand with the viewpoint that actually I'm going to work really hard and try and make those positive changes. I'm going to try and make a change and, you know, make it more diverse in ways that I can or speak out about certain issues. And it's like interesting you made this point because when I first started speaking out, a lot of people had that viewpoint of like, well, you're still doing it or you should just be so grateful to be in this position, especially, like I said, as a young brown woman in the industry, not many of us are given chances. So when you are, it's like, well, just shut up and put up. You're still doing it and you're still making money doing it. But it's about being mindful and doing things that you're also passionate about. I think when I first started out, my sole focus was like modeling and oh my God, fashion week, I need to walk this show and this show and this show and I need to book this cover and what campaign can I get next? Whereas now I'm more mindful of accepting jobs that resonate with, with me and, and what I stand for, my ethos and doing things outside of modeling, doing public speaking, doing my TED talks and doing things like to help raise awareness on certain issues because I think it's an amazing industry and you have so many opportunities and it just depends what path you want to take within it. Interestingly, like what to do with that question. I actually quit modeling a few months ago because I just wasn't enjoying it anymore. And like, but while I was modeling, I felt like there was this culture of like, you can't complain because you should be so grateful to be here. And I feel like modeling that exists where it doesn't in like any other job. Like if something is going wrong in like other jobs, like you're allowed to like speak out about it or complain without being told like, you should just be so happy to be here. And like, there was always that of like, when you got you got a job for a new client like you weren't you literally weren't allowed to 
complain or like even this weird culture of like bringing your agency gifts and flowers and it's like thank you for doing your job and like getting me work like I don't know why I have to like suck up to you like and it did feel like that like if you like or like that certain agents had favorites and that they would push for them for like for them to get more work because they were like nicer with nicer to them like it's just like yeah so it was it felt like quite hard to can like talk about anything negative within the industry like while I was in it whereas with social media I feel like it's different because it's not like it's not like social media is all negative and I think as long as you're like taking well if you have a platform and you're speaking out about the negative effects in it then I think that matters but then I also do feel guilty because sometimes I'm like well I am I like making am I like <sighs> Yeah, I sometimes do feel guilty. It's like a weird thing of am I actually helping or do, like actually by should we all just quit social media and like is, I don't know. It's yeah, I don't know. It's it's tricky. But yeah. are there any final words of wisdom? Like the difficulties and the complexities and how hard it is. Uh, I'm just still pondering about this question over here of like how, like when the very, as you said, like the very fabric of our um, society is based on like, you know, profiting off of insecurities. Yeah, everyone's insecurities. Um, and so really, it's just sad there isn't really an answer, you know, there really isn't an answer. So yeah, bye everyone. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, yeah, <laughs> on that note, <laughs> see ya.